Well, it's, it's really good to be back with you all. The news here in Burgundy is that the uh, harvest is just starting for white wine pickers. Uh, several people, half a dozen people started yesterday. And so after we've finished here, I'm gonna have a little drive around the vineyards and see what I can see. But at the moment, I'm at the domain du Marquis d'Angeville. And I have a Guillaume d'Angeville next to me, who happily speaks very good English. Uh, and I'm going to ask him, first of all, before we talk about the domain and the wines, when are you planning to start picking? So we've uh, taken the decision to start next Tuesday on the 5th of September. Uh, always the most difficult uh, decision of the year, I think, to pick the right date for the harvest. Uh, this year it's particularly difficult, I would say, because uh, the, uh, the climatic conditions are very difficult to follow, to understand. And uh, we've had very warm, warm, warm weather in August and all of a sudden now today and this week is going to be relatively cool. Um, we still need uh, uh, maybe uh, one degree of alcohol in the wines before we can pick. So we think we'll, we'll be fine by the beginning of next week, uh, starting on the 5th of September. Okay. And it's uh, looking quite good from the both quality and quantity. Well, certainly quantity is looking very good. Um, there's a lot of, uh, lot of wine uh, hanging, for sure. Uh, in terms of the quality, I always hesitate to, uh, to preempt uh, before uh, knowing exactly what we're going to pick. But it looks very good indeed uh, on the face of the few uh, uh, samples that we've had analyzed. analyzed. And uh, I think it should be fine. Yeah, it's another, of course, it's another early uh, solar vintage um, uh, in the same league as uh, many of the previous uh, vintages, yeah. But it's worth pointing out that we never got the heat waves here that they had in the south of France and in Italy. Uh, I doubt if it's, it's not gone beyond 35 degrees here. No. no. And, and also, we have not had mildew anywhere near where other people had in other regions of France. We've been very lucky for that. We've avoided that. Good, so I have my fingers crossed and let's hope that it all goes well. Um, now, Guillaume, you are, how many Marquis d'Angevilles have been involved in wine here? Well, um, the, the estate has been in my family for 220 years, but strictly speaking, the answer to your strict question is only three because only my grandfather, my father and I have been Marquis one after the other. Uh, before that, it was uh, from uh, my grandfather's mother uh, that uh, that the estate came originally. So uh, I'm the third marquee and the sixth generation uh, uh, handling uh, the estate, which have always been family run. And the first marquee, of course, was very important because he was central to the establishment of Appellation Controle. Absolutely. My grandfather was uh, mandated by his peers uh, together with Henri Gouche from Nice Saint Georges to write down the hierarchy of Burgundy as it stands today for both Côte de Bonne and Côte de Nuit. And, uh, and uh, these two gentlemen actually wrote down what most people already knew, uh, but it was word of mouth and it turned into something official and, and written in stone. So tell me about the domain as it exists today. Yeah, so um, we've always been very closely associated with the village of Volnay. Uh, I like this association of the family and the village, and we're very centered on the village of Volnay. Today, we have about 16 hectares in total, uh, but the vast majority, close to uh, 14 and a half, are based in Volnay. And of those 14 and a half, 12 are in Volnay Premier Cru. So I'm, I'm very lucky because the estate uh, has the luxury to farm more than 10% of the total acreage of the village of Volnay in Premier Cru. Volnay is a small village. It's only 110 hectares uh, in total for the Premier Cru of Volnay. And uh, like I said, with my six different labels of uh, Volnay Premier Cru, I'm lucky to farm 12 hectares, almost 12 hectares. Um, so we are very much based in Volnay. We also have a small uh, holding in Merceau, Santeneau, Premier Cru, uh, for one hectare and another even smaller piece in Pomar Premier Cru Comte dessus. Uh, but like I said, the, the majority and the focus of the estate is on the village of Volnay. Um, six different labels, like I said, 
Uh, we're going to be tasting together today three of those, Taipier, Clos des Ducs, and Champagne. And the, uh, the Caillere. And well. the Caillere uh, yeah. added, so four of those. Uh, the two missing are Volnay Fremier and Volnay Clos des Angles. Both of those two parcels are located on the northern side of the village towards Pomar, uh, one below the other, Fremier and, and Clos, de, Clos des Angles, one below the other. Yeah. So when did you take over from your father? And also, what have you changed? So my father passed away very prematurely 20 years ago in July 2003. And uh, that's when I, it was unexpected. Uh, and that's when I uh, rushed back home. I was, uh, as, you, as you know, I was uh, doing something completely different because my father has, had encouraged me to have another life before coming back to the estate. And I, I was an investment banker for more than 20 years, almost 25 years. Um, and uh, when I took over, of course, I, I knew very little about winemaking, uh, even though I had missed very few harvests. Uh, but I came for the harvest uh, almost as a tourist, not really as a winemaker. <laughs> uh, so I had a lot to learn, but I was helped with that with my brother-in-law, Renaud de Villette, who had been working with my father for quite a few years, maybe 15 years, in fact before my father died. And so um, when, I, when I came back in 2003, my first vintage was 2003, which was a very difficult um, year. Also very early, uh, we started the harvest on the 25th of August. Uh, so this was really uh, only a few weeks after my father had passed away. Um, and um, I, I decided that I wanted to be uh, very low profile for a few years because I really didn't want to uh, explain what I was going to do without really knowing what I was going to do. But generally speaking, my answer to your question was always, you know, I always loved the wines that my father made. And my uh, original ambition was to try and make similar wines, same quality of wines, same precision. But of course, you know, after a while, you get a little bit more comfortable. You understand what things you would like to see uh, improved. And um, while I did not change anything significant other than converting to biodynamic, uh, I changed a number of small details, which uh, each one of them seems relatively insignificant, but the sum, the cumulative impact of those small details makes a difference. Um, but of course, the big change that I brought to the estate was the conversion to biodynamic which I um, started in 2006 <clears throat> and completed in 2009. So we've been 100% uh, biodynamic. The entirety of the estate has been biodynamic since 2009. And we started the conversion in 2006. We did it in three, three cells, if you will, three stages, because we wanted to see how the, how the vineyard reacted to, uh, to this new uh, way of farming. Um, so that, that's the main thing that I changed, yeah. And also, just to stop yourself getting bored, you have um, uh, purchased some property in the Jura as well. Yes, um, in 2012, uh, uh, I decided that I, I would like, I wanted to uh, get out of my comfort zone, if you will, a little bit, but I really wanted to find something to do close to Volnay because I wanted to be able to supervise uh, the vinification myself uh, and, and put my name on the label uh, to confirm that I stood behind the wines. Um, so uh, Jura in 2012 was relatively unknown still. Uh, I was very lucky with the timing because uh, it happened at the same time that all of a sudden people got interested in the region. Uh, and uh, over three, three and a half years, I was able to purchase about 15 hectares uh, in, in Jura, of course, at prices that have very little to do with uh, the Burgundy crisis, so it's easier to, uh, to swallow. Um, uh, and now we have a, a, an estate there, a Domain du Pelican, which is 15 hectares in size, has a brand new winery and, uh, and uh, farms the five different varieties of uh, Jura. Uh, three reds, uh, Pinot Noir, Trousseau, and Pulsard, and two whites, uh, Savagna and Chardonnay. And for both domains, you have um, a great team, including your excellent right-hand man, yes. François Duvivier. 
François de Vivier, I was, uh, I was very lucky to, uh, to identify and hire in 2005 at the estate here in Volnay. And I made him my partner in Jura, uh, <clears throat> which is both a recognition of what he's brought to me in Volnay and also because we are so close now, we're, um, we have that relationship that we can, uh, we can be partners. Yeah, so. he, he's first class. So we have got, I think you've been served the first two wines, which are both Claude Duke, 2019 and 2016. And while you taste those, I'll ask uh, Guillaume to talk a little bit about this incredible vineyard. Okay, so Claude Duc, <laughs> I often uh, refer to it as my backyard because it's really the vineyard that starts just behind the house. Um, it's a very peculiar site. Um, um, just to come back a minute, Volnay, like many vi villages of Burgundy, uh, sits in between two hills. There's a northern hill and a south hill of Volnay. And Claude Duc sits on the bottom left-hand corner of the northern hill. Bottom left-hand corner of the northern hill, which means that it has a double exposure. Um, it, it faces east on one side and south on the other. And the, uh, the steepness of that slope uh, is about equivalent south and east. That makes it a very unique uh, spot in Volnay. Uh, and in fact, that same spot, if you will, if it were on the south hill of the village, would already be on the village of Montly, so it's no longer a Volnay appellation. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the, the other important thing to remember is that, of course, the slope is important because the vineyard does not like um, uh, excess water on the surface, but also a beautiful exposure, quite deep soil, white soil, white mouths, uh, a combination of limestone and clay, but with a high uh, percentage of limestone in the soil. Uh, good drainage because of the slope, underground springs, uh, which in the very solar vintages that we've had in the recent past, plays a very important role against hydric stress in the vineyard. So overall, a lot of um, very specific characteristics which make uh, Claude Duc a very special site, a special climat. Um, maybe a little bit also about the basic rules of vintification. Obviously, they can change one vintage to another, but you follow the same pattern. Yes. Um, you, you, know, you know, you were asking me earlier about things that I changed uh, since my father passed away. Uh, things that I did not change are some of the very basic things that we, uh, that we do uh, at vinification time. And for example, one of the things we do, of course, is we, we sort, uh, we sort the, the harvest uh, at the winery. But we destem 100% of the harvest. Uh, my grandfather did that. My father did that. I continue to do that. Um, and frankly, um, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, uh, I'm, I'm a little uh, resistant to change that because I think it works well for the wines of Volnay and for the style of wines that I want to make. Um, of course, when my grandfather destemmed 100%, at the time, the distemmers were not so precise as they are today. So maybe it meant only 80% distem. Uh, today, it's really truly 100%. And it, what it means is that in the vat, there's only berries. Uh, the, the philosophy behind it is we make wine out of the juice and the skins. We don't make wine out of the bone of, of, the, of the bunch. Uh, but, but of course, there is no right and wrong or wrong answer. But for me, I think distemming uh, works particularly well. It, it, it uh, adds an, uh, the possibility of cleanliness and precision, which I like. Uh, the other thing that is uh, uh, specific to, to uh, Dangerville, although now a number of people have moved to that also, is that we avoid punching down. We don't punch down. We only recycle the juice. Um, we pump it uh, at the bottom of the vat and we uh, spray it over the top of the vat so that the, uh, the cap of the vat is always wet um, and that there is sig uh, significant movement and there is extraction going on that works well for us, but it's a smooth extraction as opposed to punching down and risking again, uh, maybe some uh, bad taste that we wouldn't want to have in the vines. Um, uh, then the cuvaison is uh, fairly classic. We have a small period of time 
before fermentation starts, um, uh, cool, cool uh, maceration, uh, pre-fermentation, and then the fermentation starts, and we are we avoid to be uh, too uh, interventionist. There, we we want to leave the wine uh, make itself uh, on its own, if possible. We just verify on a regular basis uh, the density curve and the temperature curve, and we make sure that the corresponding points uh, are mm -hmm. broadly in line. And if we, if there's a correction to make, we will cool the vat or heat the vat, the vat. Although, of course, in the last 20 years, we've cooled more, more times than <laughs> we have heated. Exactly. Are we going to taste the uh, uh, one, one wine as well? 16. 16. 16. We've got that. OK, so you've got in your glasses, I think, just 29 and 2016 at the moment. We're going to join you with uh, some of the wines uh, on the list, but not, not the whole lot. Um, Two very different vintages, of course, 2019, one of the sunny years. Mid-September picking, I would think. Yes, yes, uh, 19, uh, 19, I noted it down for you. Don't want to say something. Uh, 12th of September. Okay. Yeah. And 16 was one of those years that started with a difficult reputation because of the frost damage. and Everybody was so upset by it that people cried disaster. But... <clears throat> In the end, I think the reds turned out beautifully. Yes, something very specific about 16 in Volnay is that uh, the frost that took place at the end of April uh, was um, um, such that uh, the cool, cool air, if you will, went down the hill and you could really easily draw the line above which frost did not hit. And in fact, Claude Duc is quite high on the hill. I didn't say that earlier. It's quite high on the hill. Uh, maybe three, 300 meters, 310 meters at the bottom of Claude Duc, which is relatively high for Burgundy standards. And it was basically not hit by the frost uh, in 16. Ah, okay, so some of your vineyards were, but yeah. it's not Champagne was, uh, Fromier was, Claude des Angles was, but Claude Duc was higher up than that. So, um, has anybody any questions or would like to comment on the 19 and the 16? Or it looks to me you've now got the 15 served as well. Um, which we'll come on to in a second. You will have heard me speak before about 2015, saying that it has the concentration of 2005 and it's got the charm of 2010, and 5 plus 10 equals 15. Wow. Jasper, the, um, just tasting the 19, the uh, density and flesh of fruit there, uh, it's absolutely spectacular. It's very well put together and composed. Uh, for me, the 16 probably doesn't have that uh, the flesh and density of fruit, but there's a much more sort of lift uh, and sort of ethereal nature to it. Uh, but for me personally, I think that 19 is an absolute winner. That's superb. It, it is a vintage which, unlike 18 and 20, I think you can really enjoy from the start. I mean, me being me in English and all the rest of it, I'm going to want to keep them for a long time. But there's nothing to stop you having fun with that beautifully glossy uh, fruit, as long as the alcohol has been properly managed, which may not be the case for everybody, but will be with somebody smart like uh, Guillaume. I'm also going to say that, in my experience, people who've been doing biodynamics for a long time seem to be getting much better balanced grapes and therefore wine uh, in these hot vintages. I think it's a good comment. I think it's, um, I've heard that one before. And, and I often say that if I look at <clears throat> 15, 18, 19, 20, 22 even, um, we see that. Uh, the uh, the impact of uh, the very solar vintages, the very solar weather that we've had, is less as we go along. Um, it seems that the, the the vines are starting to understand what's going on, uh, and they are adapting uh, to the new uh, climate situation, and is more easily uh, probably when it's uh, when it's a biodynamic farming. Mm -hmm. I would go along with that comment. What I really like about 16s, and I'm not drinking them at the moment, but occasionally tasting them, is that freshness of acidity at the back, which really does give the lift that I think Adam was talking about. Um, so yeah. When would you ideally drink these two vintages? Well, <clears throat> I, I, I will go along also with your comment that 19 is, uh, is, uh, is already approachable today. 
uh, even though you know there's these are two long lasting vintages i think and um, 16 personally I, I i enjoy very much because of that acidity that tension in the wine it's a very sharp wine um it's a style that i like and i enjoy uh, uh, but of course these wines have a lot uh, uh, to come to to bring to us uh, uh in, in many years to come yeah hmm. and now you've got three 2015s which are Claude duc champon and Caire. And maybe a word or two from um, Guillaume about the difference between Champagne and Caire compared to Claude Duc. So uh, I, I was referring to the, the two uh, hills of Volnay earlier. Claude Duc is on the northern hill of the village. Champagne and Caire is on the, are on the south hill of the village, together with Taipier, which we will be tasting later. Um, Champagne, in many ways, can be described as a uh, the archetype of uh, Volnay Premier Cru in my mind. Um, Claude Duc is, is a superior wine, but it's it, perhaps a little less typical of Volnay Premier Cru style. Champagne has that uh, femininity to it, uh, the you know, beautiful wine, very uh, integrated tannins, very silky always, very velvety, uh, cocooning style, uh, which uh, makes it a, a more feminine style of wine. Uh, which is typical of what uh, people normally think of Volney, of Volney's wine as being very, very feminine. Um, the, uh, of course, the, the soil there is, is different from, uh, from Claude Duc. Um, it's a more brown soil, more clay, less limestone than in Claude Duc, and uh, a lot of ferrous content as well, um, uh, especially at the bottom of, uh, of the hill, because Champagne is a long, long, uh, vineyard. Uh, the rows are about uh, 300 meters long. They, they start at the bottom of the hill, almost at the bottom of the hill, and go uh, towards mid-hill and beyond mid-hill. The, the top of the, of the parcel, if you will, is, is uh, subject to more erosion, of course, than the bottom. And there's less soil at the top and uh, deeper soil at the bottom. And uh, Caire uh, sits uh, just south of, of Champagne. Uh, also facing east. It's a beautiful terroir. Uh, my Caire is Caire dessus. Uh, it's not specified on the label, but it's the top of the Caire uh, along the high road that goes from Volnay to Merceau. Um, very uh, stony style of, uh, of uh, terroir, as the name suggests, because Caire comes from the word caillou, which means stone. Um, so, so Caire is always a a, a very mineral kind of wine, but it, it's almost ethereal. It's, uh, I often say that the wine seems to be floating in my mouth. It's, uh, it's a very elegant light, yet there is momentum in the wine, but there is that elegance and that lightness uh, that is very typical of Caire, that you can really recognize uh, the terroir that way. So three 2015s, was that uh, August or early September? No, this was early September. This was... Um, on the 4th of September, so very, very similar to, uh, to this year. And we have the Claudie Duc 15. As for sincere apologies, we had a bit of a logistical mix-up. We only have the Caire and the Claudie Duc 15 ah, uh, on, okay. our, on our right. end. But if you got all three, we'd love to hear the feedback. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, Caire is Caire is probably the best premier crew in Pinot Noir Maraîcher. It's one of the best premier crews in um, uh, Chassagne Maraîcher. And for all people who don't own Claude Duc, it's the best premier crew in Volnay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for people who do own Claude Duc, it's only the second best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a saying in Volnay which says that if you don't know Caire, you don't know Volnay. Si tu ne connais pas Caillere, tu ne connais pas Volney. Um, so, um, like I said, uh, it's, it's, it's a terroir which I, I find particularly attractive. But uh, in the Claude Duc 15, of course, uh, uh, if, if I may, um, I think your, your earlier discussion about 10 plus 5 equals 15 does not really work for me, I don't think. Okay. Uh, um, because uh, uh, 15... Uh, um, let, let me say, I, I always found 10 as being one of the most elegant uh, vintages that I have ever made. 
Uh, I think 15 is a, is a very exuberant uh, vintage here. Um, and five, which we may be tasting later, um, five is a, is a very tight vintage, uh, which in many ways has reminded me of uh, 76, where we've been waiting for the 76 to open for such a long time, we got a little bit uh, impatient about it. <laughs> So no, they only took 40 years, so we're ready by 2016 at the uh, exactly. 76s. Yes, um, uh, agreed in a sense. Um, but we're going to have a 2010 in Magnum and we have two 2005s, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so 15, 15 was a very dry vintage, very solar vintage. It came in Volnay after three vintages of, uh, of hailstorms. We had a terrible series, we'll talk about that with the 12, but 12, 13, and 14 were three years of very bad hailstorms in Volnay. And 15 came as a relief, even though we had very low yields in 15, but not because of the hailstorm, but because of the drought, really. And, um, and because the vines were a bit tired. And, the, and the vines ago. had been tired because of yeah. the hailstorms in the pre preceding years, yes. And so, um, but we, of course, we welcomed the vintage because it was finally, uh, uh, you know, unhurt, um, so to speak, by by hail. Um, it's a it's a very uh, luxurious, exuberant vintage. Um, it looks. Uh, uh, but I think now the concentration and the the drier style, as in two thousand five, is coming through, which probably wasn't true two years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think we're beginning to get to a position in which it's it's gone slightly quiet on us. You can still see the energy and the richness of the fruit, and it absolutely covers all the vein structure. Mm -hmm. But for me, I would definitely not drink my 2015s at the moment. I think they're in the adolescent period a little bit. Agreed entirely. Uh, so uh, if, I, if I had 16 and 15 in my cellar, I wouldn't touch the 15 until I'd finished my 16s, that's for sure. <laughs> I think you probably do have them both in your cellar. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Um, would anybody like to comment back on them? Um, uh, I do the 15s, or are you ready to? We'll ask for the next flight to be poured, the 12, 10, and 9. But I'm happy to hear any more thoughts from, from the room. Um, Jasper, Guillaume, hello, Hamish here. I just had a question actually about the biodynamics. Um, so a bit less hair since you last saw me, Jasper, probably. Um, um, yeah, question about the biodynamics. You said that in, in, a, in a hot vintage, it will uh, make better grapes or more balanced grapes. Um, in a cold vintage and a wet vintage, I've, I've heard winemakers say that the vines would have a, a literally a better immune system because they're not being fed fertilizers, not having to fight on pests and so on. Is, is that true? And any comments? Yeah, I, I, I think the, uh, what, what, uh, what we meant earlier was that uh, if you have practiced biodynamy for a number of years, when very solar vintages come, then the vines have had the luxury of having a soil which has been de decompacted for a number of years. And therefore it's easier for them to go deep down inside the soil deeper um, than if the soil is compacted by the usage of chemicals and fertilizers and everything else. But generally speaking, biodynamy, the purpose of it is really to give the vines uh, the ability to fight the disease before the disease hits them and we need to cure the disease. So um, it works in, in any type of vintages. The difficulty of course is that when you switch from quote unquote traditional farming to biodynamy, it's, it's as if you finish your antibiotics uh, prescription and then you're, you're back to being uh, you know, on your own, you know, the vineyard for a few years is quite fragile because it's in that period where it needs to readjust uh, to the new situation where there's when there's only uh, only that the biodynamic preparations and the organic uh, farming that that's at work. And for example, in when we converted in in, in 2006, the first part of our estate to um, to biodynamy. Two years later, we had vintage 08, 
which was a disastrous season, as uh, I'm sure Jasper will remember. Very, very wet season. Um, and until the very end, we thought the vintage was uh, maybe going to be declassified all in Volney Village. It was so difficult. We were salvaged in the end by the month of September, which was beautiful. But, but we, we had to hang on um, during the season, which was so wet. And everybody around us was saying, you see, you should never have switched to biodynamic. You know, now you're, you're lost. You have nothing to, uh, to salvage your, your vintage. And we hung on. We, we decided we had to swallow it and, and do it. Um, and we finally uh, it prevailed. But, but it's in that uh, once that fragile period, if you will, is, is behind you, then biodynamic will benefit the vineyard regardless of the characteristics of the vintage. I, I just had something to that. You mentioned the extra depths that the vines go down to, but I think perhaps even more important is what's happening on the tips of the little baby roots, uh, the mycorrhizal function, they call it. And I have a feeling that the biodynamic vines are much more sensitive uh, in terms of what they can pick up from the immediate little bits of um, below the ground soil around them than would be the case of uh, conventional mm -hmm. farming. Um, and that's what I think really helped in the warmer years when the biodynamic producers <clears throat> of long standing actually came out with decent sized crops in the year like 2020, when many of the conventional people had very low crops. And the wisdom has been up to now that if you go down the organic and then biodynamic path, you're likely to have a smaller crop. But in 2020, and perhaps 2022 as well, we saw almost the opposite. However, in a year like 2021, when you're uh, struck down by frost, I doubt if there's anything that oh. helps you with biodynamics. So all my biodynamic friends, their yields were every bit as bad in 21 as anybody else. Yeah, no frost, uh, you, there's nothing you can do there's against frost. frost. Um, no. So you should now have in your glasses, I hope 2012, 2010 and 2009, two of which have come out of magnums, I believe, so you'll have more to drink later. Um, and uh, words, um, Guillaume, about those three vintages. Yeah, so if we start with uh, 2012, um, the good news is you have a magnum, because if you had a bottle, it would be a fake. <laughs> uh, why is that? It's because uh, the crop was so low in 2012 that I made the decision to only bottle in magnums. And we made, I believe from memory, 1,287 magnums worldwide. And that was it. Um, so um, it's about a quarter of a crop in 2012 overall for the, for the estate. And, and the Claude de Duc is, uh, is bang there in, with, with the average. Um, why, why is it such a low crop? It's because 12 is, is like I said earlier, it's the first vintage of a very significant hailstorm. Um, we had a hailstorm at the end of June, on the 30th of June, which already destroyed um, a large uh, portion of the crop. And then we had a second hailstorm at the beginning of August, on the 1st of August, uh, which uh, sort of finished the job. Um, in between, um, you know, we had a very difficult season overall. So it turned out um, that um, this vintage uh, uh, was a very painful vintage for all of us in Volney. Uh, like, as you, I'm sure you all know, uh, hail storms are very localized. So, uh, you know, Volney was particularly bad hit. Uh, not, not, of course, not all the villages of, uh, of Burgundy were hit uh, as badly as, as Volney was. Um, but nonetheless, we, we made wines with a lot of character, I think. Um, uh, I don't know how we don't have it here, but. Uh, I hope the wines, uh, the wine, the magnum will show well in Hong Kong. Um, good character, um, you know, strong standing, so to speak, of this of those uh, Claude Duc uh, nineteen. But of course, it's it's a bit tricky when uh, when you have only a quarter of a crop. Two thousand twelve, uh, two thousand ten. I'm sorry, uh, in Taipei. Um, uh, for many years, in fact, for the best part of ten years. I have said that I thought uh, 2010 was my best effort since I took over the estate in 2003. Um, I, like, uh, I like the elegance, the precision, 
the cleanliness of those wines in 2010. I find that, uh, you know, uh, if it's an expression of Pinot Noir, which I think is uh, per perfectly classic, but in a good sense, uh, uh, classic in a good sense. Uh, a lot of style in those wines, elegance, precision, like I said, purity, and also energy. I, I think a great combination in 2010. So I've said that for many, many years, and uh, for the first time I changed my mind, or I said, I said I, I found uh, an equivalent to 10 in 2020. So um, we don't have any 2020 to, to, to taste today, but uh, uh, it's, uh, that's my next best, I would say, uh, would, very close to 19 as well, by the way. Uh, we've had a series of uh, uh, lucky vintages also. We want it, not just hailstones, also very good vintages. <laughs> And then 09, uh, 09 Champagne, um, um, uh, right now it's a perfect spot to drink this, this bottle. Uh, um, so I'm glad that you have some uh, to taste on your side. Uh, it's really a, a, a vintage where, which I loved, also an early vintage. Uh, we started the harvest um, uh, on the 10th of September. Um, uh, it, very good condition. The, the season was uh, benign, uh, no, no, nothing to to uh, to worry about really in that particular vintage. Uh, when when it first came out, uh, it was quite an exuberant uh, vintage in the in the winery. Lots of aromas, lots of things. Um, I was uh, thinking maybe we have another O5, but it was different from O5. A lot more elegance to it, a lot more distinction. In, in my mind, uh, in my estate, at least in Volnay, um, than in 05. So we, the wines uh, have evolved a lot quicker than the 05s. And um, like I said, I think they're a perfect spot right now. I hope the bottle shows well too. And we're looking at, for the first time, Taipier as a vineyard in the 2010. So tell us about your holding of Taipier. Yeah, so Taipei uh, is quite high on the hill. It's uh, on the south hill of the village as well. It sits above uh, uh, Champagne, uh, uh, the other side of the road, very near the, uh, the top of the hill, near the, the woods. Um, uh, it's a quite a steep area as well. It's a beautiful terroir, a beautiful view on the uh, Valley de la Saône, uh, facing plain east. Um, but it's quite open uh, to the wind. Um, and um, it's it's always kind of a cool area. The wines uh, taste cooler than the other uh, terroirs of Volnay. Uh, more masculine often. We, we would say that uh, often we describe the Taipei as being the most masculine wine of the range of uh, Dangerville. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a fair point. The wine is reserved in the early years. Um, it takes a, lot, a bit longer to uh, to develop and to give its full potential, but then it's a very long-lasting wine, very long-lasting wine. We um, our, our own Taipei is just above uh, the Montaise Taipei, just above it. Okay. So in the room, uh, your 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 comments or questions. I, I think we really enjoy the ten Taipei. We it, it resonates everything that Guillaume has been saying. Yeah. Um, very fresh. I don't know if it's also the format in addition. I'd be curious what uh, the owns view is. I, I really enjoyed the 12. I I'm, personally have collected a, a significant quantity of those magnums given the, the scarcity, but uh, really enjoyed drinking that today. Uh, on the, sorry, on the 12, particularly on the finish, there's a lovely saline character uh, mm -hmm. to it. That really sort of, I think actually that will really aid it in, in aging as well. But it's something that we probably haven't tasted in any other vintage right. so far. Yeah. Um, is there another vintage that you might associate with that? Uh, saline. Uh, I associate salinity with uh, with Volnay Premier Pleu Fremier, which is often very saline, saline as well on the finish. Uh, no, uh, normally, uh, uh, I, I, I uh, associate it with the fact that uh, Fremier has a very shallow soil and therefore. Uh, the roots uh, go through the rock itself for some length, uh, and therefore that salinity is uh, just a, uh, an expression of uh, the minerality of the soil. Uh, but here it must be a vintage thing. Yeah, here it's yes. a vintage thing, yeah. Um, 
some 2021s are a little bit saline. Yeah, I can do not so much. No, 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 no. no. good question. No real answer. <laughs> but, but you know, no. yeah. Yeah. Um, and how is the 09? Um, because this is a vintage which I like, but on the whole, I've always said you've got to keep it a long, long time to get the best of it, to stop it being slightly on the clumsy side. But Guillaume saying that he thinks from the case of the Champagne, that should have come around nicely. I'm just tasting these wines. There's a there's two things that stand out on the later ones. Is the is the acidity. So if I was looking at these wines and I was trying to find a, a signature that goes with them, there's a there, there seems to be a backbone of acidity all the way through, even with the twelve. But when I go back to the five, I don't know if it's because you said that you went by a dynamic of six, but the fives have a different acidity profile for me when I'm tasting it, even though five is a better vintage. So I'm just wondering, does biodynamics actually change the acidity or the, 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 the quality of the acidity that you get? Uh, you know, the, the, the difficulty with biodynamics, of course, is there's no way you can, uh, you can really uh, compare the same exact wine in the same vintage in, in both uh, protocols, if you will, the, the bio, uh, biodynamic farming versus uh, traditional farming. So it's, it's, we, we can all speculate about what it would be if it was not biodynamic, but it's, it remains uh, a, an academic discussion rather than uh, uh, proven scientifically. Uh, that's why I'm a little prudent about that. I did do it in the early years with Anne Claude Lefebvre because she converted half of each plot to biodynamics and left half untouched and then made some examples of the wine separately uh, so that she could then produce the tasting. Mm. And you get this sense of precision um, in the biodynamic farming, which I think it's as if the acidity had a purity in its own mm. right. Um, so I think you probably can point to a change in the acidity post biodynamics. Well, the, the fact the fact is that the, the more I taste my wines versus my father's wines, for example, uh, the, of course you you have to. Uh, uh, benchmark it because of the aging, which is different, of course, but but nonetheless, there is that sense of purity, cleanliness, precision, uh, and harmony, uh, a sense of, of completeness of the wines when they're biodynamic, that uh, that uh, really is, uh, is is striking. And also, in some of those vintages where uh, where the acidity is low, something else takes the place of the acidity and gives you that impression that. Uh, that there is acidity there, but it comes from maybe from the tannins or from something else in the wines. And, and you, but and, and you, you pointed in your comment that you were putting 05 as a, as a superior vintage. Um, you know, it's an arguable comment. Yes, that's okay. <laughs> that's just what I would say. I, I am a great fan of 05s. Um, yeah, can I just qualify? I, I wasn't saying in terms of the wines I was tasting, I'm just saying that you know you 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 change in 06 to biodynamic and it was done by i9 so but there is a difference in the acidity i prefer the acidity in the later vintages and you can mm. see the difference in the 10 and uh, all the way and i think 19 uh I, there's a, there's a i agree with the, uh, adam on this there's a density and there's a precision and there's a backbone acidity uh, out of all the wines i've tasted so far the one i've been most impressed with is with the 19 and the and the 10 uh, mm -hmm. just in terms of the way that he's been put together. Mm -hmm. so, I don't, I... so you have the O5s and they're both um, vineyards that you've looked at. Um, so what I would be expecting out of O5 is it's wines where you are still, you probably get more tannins evident in O5 than the other vintages so far, I would think. In fact, of any of the vintages which are going to be drunk. Uh, and they are taking a long, long time. So at home, I've been drinking Bourgogne Rouge 05s, and I've started, I've taken out of, out of the warehouse village wines in 05, but I haven't really started them yet. Okay, um, so uh, any, are there any different views on the 05s or what Satpal said uh, goes, for, goes for you in general? Or are you just beginning to taste them now? Uh, one thing I will say about 05, if I may interject here, this was one of my, uh, this is only my third vintage, uh, and it was striking 
the aromas in the winery when we picked the grapes. I mean, there was so, so much fruit in that winery. I had never really had a, such a, an expression of a fruit, pure, beautiful fruit uh, in that year, an absolutely exquisite uh, sanitary uh, state. I mean, you know, perfect, no, no sorting to do, really. Uh, so that should come back when they're ready. Exactly. When, when the structure has released the fruit again. Yes. That's my belief, this vintage. Yeah. But it's 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 possible that it will take quite a few more years. Yes. <laughs> I, I concur with that. <laughs> Uh, very much so. <laughs> Jasper, uh, we were just discussing the 05. We understand completely the point made earlier around these being similar to 76 wedding for when they might open because these are huge wines. Uh, actually, you can taste the tannins on the back still. It's still a bit drying on the finish, but yet there's this enormous wealth of fruit. And I'm still not sure these are quite ready. No, I think that's right. And for me, 1976s, almost whoever made them, uh, took 40 years. Um, and 2005s from the vintage, I think, will be more like 25 years before they uh, release. So that's not too far away. That's um, another seven years. Mm. But uh, if you have them in your cellar and you don't have a, a vast quantity of them, then just leave them at the back of the cellar. Um, because I do believe they're going to be so wonderful when they are ready. That it would be a mistake to waste them by opening too many too early. So we haven't, uh, you haven't got um, 2004, which as we know is that vintage, which for many people has a little greenness in it. 2003, which was the first of the, the monster super ripe years. And in fact, we've never had a vintage as hot or as unusual no. since. Yeah. So that was a, a, a baptism for you. Exactly. 2002, which as you know, I'm very fond of, um, uh, a year with real elegance. And if you could compare a vintage to a particular appellation, then it's a Volnay style vintage for me. Yes. Um, I like this concept, I, uh, Jasper. I, I really uh, think that some vintages suit specific villages, particularly yes. well in some cases. And O2 and 10 are made for Volnay. Yeah. Uh, in many ways. 2001 was another big hail year here in Volnay, as in fact was 04. Um, it, in 12, 13, 14, it was pretty much everybody in the Cape of Bain that got it. 2001, four and eight was just Volnay special present. Yeah. Uh, um, the oldest. Yeah. Um, 2000s have refused to lie down. Um, and uh, one or two people might even have picked before the big rainstorm. Um, but uh, it wasn't the vintage which we expected wines to last a long time, but I think they, they did, they, I mean, do, they, they, they still are. Oh, yeah, they're, they're still wonderful, the, the 2000s. Yeah. It, I have a, a quick anecdote there, uh, maybe you know Please. it, uh, Jasper, but uh, uh, the, the regretted Hubert de Monti, who uh, ran uh, Domaine de Monti for many years, the, uh, the lawyer, um, referred to a vintage 2000 as quote unquote, the picnic vintage, which, which, which uh, in his mind was uh, not, uh, not a defect. It was just, uh, he was saying, this is just a, a lovely wine to enjoy, but he never thought, and no one actually thought that they would, the wines would last that long. And today, if, if anyone has any uh, 2000 still, they would enjoy them tremendously, yeah. Now, the, uh, the Burgundians, um, uh, in, in particular, I have a habit, which I don't completely agree with, of saying that all vintages which end in nine are always good. Um, and I think that's tempting fate uh, for, for 2029. <laughs> but my view is that the vintages ending in nine are almost always better in the Cote de Bone than the Cote de Nuit. It's certainly true of 79, where it held in the Cote de Nuit. Mm -hmm. I believe it's true in 89. Um, and when I say Cote de Bone, I mean Volnay. <laughs> uh, and 99 also, uh, the yields were better managed in the Cote de Bone and the picking was earlier. In the second half of the harvest, you began to get some rain, but not in the first half. Um, and in 2019 as well, probably 2009. Um, so we have, uh, you have two 99s and we're gonna join you in one of them in the Taipier. This is a vintage which for me has never really stopped being enjoyable to drink. Uh, it was nice early, 
The tannin levels have never tasted very strong, but they have always been quite strong by analysis. But they've never taken taken over. It's always been the fruit that's been in charge. And I don't yet see 99s beginning to uh, fade away uh, at what, coming up for 24 years old. Um, so you should have um, type A and clearly you play with. So now this is, uh, I don't take any credit or uh, or anything about this wine because this is a wine made by my father. Yeah. So you, know, you were saying earlier, 2010 is your best vintage uh, since 2003 when you took over. So what do you consider to be your, your father's best vintage or vintages? Uh, I would say without, without hesitation, I think 64 is my father's uh, peak vintage. Again, 64 is a classic vintage which suits Volnay like nothing else. I mean, one of the best wines I've ever drunk is, is a Volnay from uh, the Hotel. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, it's was on uh, 64. So, so the first vintage you share our hotel and you just made the most extraordinary, brilliant wines that year. That, uh, Guillaume, really everyone's looking at Paolo at the moment for the, uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the offer list. All the juice. We won't sell them some hotel wines. We won't tell Guillaume. But, uh, no, that but was. Um, 64, he made great wines, for sure, mm -hmm. yeah. So the 99 is now, the, the colors remain pretty good. The bouquet is beginning to get the first signs of a little leathery touch uh, with some age, mm -hmm. but not uh, not too much. I think uh, this is on the type A. I should think the Clodé Duke is probably tasting uh, younger than the type A of the two. Um, how are they showing with you? Or are you just getting them now? We have the two side by side. Um, yeah. I think. Type E is a bit more ethereal. The Dukes is the Rolls Royce. Mm. <laughs> yes. But very impressive. Very impressive. It's at that slight turning point, as you just mentioned, in terms of evolutions. I was tasting with uh, Henri Boyot once, um, not so long ago, and uh, we were tasting uh, Pomar Rougien. And I said, what do you think, Henri? What do you think of this idea to propose um, Rougien for maybe being a Grand Cru? And he said, it's nonsense. There are only two vineyards, uh, which should be Grand Cru, which aren't. And uh, I was chatting to my friend Guillaume Dongeville the other day, and we were absolutely agreed. We thought Puligny Clos de la Mouchère, which is Henri Boyer's monopoly, and Volnay Clos des Ducs, the only two. <laughs> so, but it is a special vineyard, Clos des Ducs, for sure. You know, <laughs> one small anecdote about this, well, because the Dukes. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I actually had a question, a historical question, Guillaume, which yeah. was, um, I, I had read or heard somewhere that the the, the reason that Nuit Saint Georges and Volnay don't have any Grand Crus was because of uh, a, a, a very selfless. Uh, um, non, not arrogant decision by by your forebears and by Monsieur Gouge to not put forward any of their own wines um, for Grand Cru status to, to to ensure that no one thought they were being biased or favourite. Is, is is there some truth in that? Or yeah, it's a it's a true story. Um, my father told me that story, and uh, Christian and Pierre Gouge, who are my equivalent generation in the in the Gouge family have the same story on their side. The two gentlemen, Henri Gouge and my grandfather, whose name was Sam, um, declared publicly, when they were mandated to write down the hierarchy of Burgundy, they declared publicly that there would be no Grand Cru in Nuit Saint-Georges nor in Volnay, so that no one would um, even uh, have an impression of a possibility uh, of a conflict of interest, so to speak, yeah, that they were working for the general interest of the region and not for their own villages or or, or personal interests. So to this day, there's no Grand Cru in Nuit Saint Georges, no Grand Cru in Volnay. Um, Nuit Saint Georges actually applied uh, a few years ago for Les Saint Georges, uh, but uh, the file has gone nowhere, as as far as I know. It may be warming up again. Is what I hear. Okay. So we'll see. All right. And uh, of course, you know, 
uh, Clodeduc being a monopole, um, it's not easy for a village to decide that a monopole will be the Grand Cru of the village. <laughs> so I think the likelihood uh, that uh, Claude Duc would become a Grand Cru, if only for that reason, is low. But but I, you don't need it. I don't need it. it. It's got its special I, reputation. I was going to say. I was going to say. I much prefer the status quo, which I think uh, is a good reason why the village of Olney is so friendly, amicable. And uh, we work well together. We exchange uh, mm. tips. Um, you know, we have a lot of biodynamic farmers in Volnay, and we we always exchange. We make tests yes. together. Uh, we compare notes. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, ambiance in Volnay, so it's nice. And if we if we had discussions about concrete, I think it would, the the risk of jeopardizing that would be high. Mm. You're about to tell uh, an anecdote. That was the anecdote. Oh, that was the story. That was the story. Great. Now, we're going to leave you in a couple of minutes. So, firstly, I might ask Guillaume just to speak about the 91, 90, and 69 vintages that you've got still to come. Uh, and then we can ask him the last couple of questions after that. And, Michael, I know what one of those questions will be. Uh, okay. So, um, these are vintages, of course, which I'm less um, uh, familiar with. In fact, uh, 69. I, I was trying to think last time I tasted the 69 and I remembered that I had invited Michel Bétan, uh, who is from, uh, uh, at the time was Revue du Vin de France, um, uh, for lunch because I wanted to know him. Uh, so it must have been 04, 03, 04. We went to um, Laurent in Paris and they had a Claude Duc 69, which I picked on the, <laughs> on the, on the wine list. Uh, but it was... Uh, 69, uh, I hope you will enjoy the bottle because it, we produced some great, my father produced some great wines in 69. Uh, it was a, a bit of a tricky uh, season, uh, 69. Um, wet, uh, difficult, uh, cold, uh, very late uh, harvest. Uh, we started the harvest uh, in October. We started the harvest in October. Um, but the wines produced... Uh, we're very uh, also typical, clean, uh, typical Pinot Noir style vintage, which uh, which we like. In fact, uh, by the way, in the sixties, in the sixties, uh, yeah, in the sixties, Volney produced a series of uh, very interesting vintages, huh? a number of them. So, ninety and ninety one are, are really the yin and yang uh, next to one another, um, with uh, ninety being a very solar vintage, very warm. Uh, exuberant vintage and 91 being more uh, subdued, uh, perhaps more Cistercian in a way, uh, clean uh, but cool vintage. Um, and suffered from frost as and, well. And suffered from frost. frost. So it's a, it's a small vintage. Uh, 90 was a relatively big vintage. Uh, 91 was not. Um, uh, but for what it's worth, my father always preferred his 91s to his 90s. Uh, for, so did your brother-in-law. Uh, so did my yes. brother-in-law, yes. exactly. So uh, because of the, the breed, uh, the class, the style of, uh, of the vintage. But of course, 1990 um, remains a, a great vintage. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to be able to buy back two cases of Claude Duc 1990 from uh, La Tour d'Argent, uh, which is the three-star restaurant in Paris. They sold a portion of their cellar uh, at auctions uh, because they needed the money to uh, refurbish the kitchen or something like that. And I picked up uh, two cases of Claudine Duc 90, okay. which I knew. Well, the, the... I, with several uh, people in that room there, we had drunk the Taipier 91 from the Tour d'Argent. Ah, yeah. Yes. Ah, yeah. yeah. Good for you. Good yeah. for you. Michael will remember. So um, over to you then for any final questions. Michael, do you want to kick off with your favorite? Absolutely. Uh, so, Guillaume, uh, yeah. if you could choose to buy any vineyard in Burgundy, money is not the issue. We have significant financial backing here in the room to support you. <laughs> Which would it be? And why? And why? And, and why? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I started the discussion by saying that uh, I loved uh, the association between Volnay and Dangerville, and Dangerville and Volnay. And also, I have the luxury to be able to walk to each one of my vineyards uh, in less than 15 minutes. And, you know, for me, it's adventurous to go north of Beaune from Volnay. Um, 
I, I am a, I'm a sedentary type. You know, I want I want to be around and control well my well my holdings and to be able to supervise them very quickly without taking my car. Uh, but and joking aside, um, uh, the, the the list would be very long and the usual suspects would be would be on that. But if if you allow me to pick two. I will, I will pick the reasonable one, which I would pick something in Volney, and I would love to have Volney Santno. And uh, if I went, uh, if I stopped my rule of being around, uh, around the estate, around the winery, and, uh, and, and made a, a venture elsewhere, I would uh, love to have, uh, probably I would pick Amoureuse, uh, uh, Champol Amoureuse. Because mm. Volney Antono. Exactly. 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 Normally, people say Volney is the Chambord of the South, but right. we, know, we know better. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, is there any other question? Otherwise, we will leave you to enjoy your food and the last of the wine, and we'll go out and look at the vineyards here. Lovely. All good. In which case, um, we will. Hey, one, one, one second. One second. I, Jasper, I, I do have a question. Yeah. Okay. You, you had, you've had two very successful career, right? So, which one is more challenging, and which one is more satisfying? <laughs> uh, uh, you, you know, uh, I was, I was, I'm starting now to count the number of years because very soon I will uh, go above the threshold, and I would have been a, a winemaker for longer. <laughs> For longer than having been a banker, so I have like four more years to go, and that will be the case. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but you know, um, I, I was extremely privileged and lucky. I have to say to have those two careers. I was lucky um, because I was a banker at a time when it was really fun to be a banker, and also it was uh, financially very rewarding, which allowed me uh, to maintain the estate in family hands. So here I'm not joking. I think if I had not been a banker before, the likelihood that this estate would have been sold was would have been quite high. But because I was uh, uh, in that position, I was able to maintain it, and in fact to buy to buy out all the other heirs to my parents. So I'm now the sole holder of the estate, which I think is uh, is, is, is is fantastic. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, but of course, you know. Um, uh, Financially, it's a totally different uh, equation, uh, and also intellectually. Sometimes, you know, I miss the uh, the complicated discussions that I had as a banker, uh, which I, I don't have. But of course, uh, I gained so much uh, uh, conviviality, exchange, uh, possibility to travel and and share uh, passion uh, in my new uh, in my not so new anymore. Uh, career uh, at the estate uh, uh, that it's of course uh, so rewarding, incredibly rewarding. Plus the fact that, uh, um, I, like I said, I'm only the sixth generation in a long chain, and uh, uh, I'm pretty certain now that the estate will have another generation also okay. in family hands, um, and therefore. Um, you know the the story goes on, and it's, uh, being part of that, I think, is uh, is a great privilege. Yeah, so I enjoyed both. Is would be the answer to your question, and I'm happy where I am now for sure. That was a great question. Thank you. So well, thank you so uh, much. Thank you, Jasper, and thank you, Guillaume. That was great. Good. Thank you. We will be back on another occasion once the harvest is out of the way. Uh, we will be back with uh, uh, a further victim from the vineyards of Burgundy. But uh, thanks for being with us and enjoy the rest of the wines. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.